Hello and welcome to Radcliffe Cardiology's webinar in association with Interventional Cardiology Review. I'm Harriet Seeger and I'm delighted to welcome back Dr. Jacqueline Saw, Interventional Cardiology Clinical Associate Professor at the Vancouver General Hospital, University of British Columbia. Welcome back, Dr. Saw. Thank you, Harriet. Well, it's nice to have you with us. And today, um, Dr. Saw will be giving us an update on spontaneous coronary artery di dissection, a condition that is typically underdiagnosed. Um, and you'll have an opportunity to ask Dr. Saw any questions via the text box on your screen throughout the course of the webinar, and we'll answer as many as possible at the end. So without further ado, I'll hand over to Dr. Saw. Please go ahead. Great. Thank you so much, Harriet. Thanks for having me here to discuss uh, an update on SCAT, spontaneous coronary artery dissection. Uh, here are my disclosures, uh, including uh, research grants uh, from CIHR and uh, a few companies uh, for uh, research. This is a brief overview of uh, my presentation this morning, uh, which will be relatively comprehensive, um, and uh, I will try to focus on some of the more novel uh, literature that's been published recently, uh, including data from our own um, studies. So what is SCAD? SCAD is defined as a spontaneous, uh, which means it's non-traumatic and non-iatrogenic separation of the coronary artery wall by intramural hematoma, uh, creating a false lumen. And this separation can occur between any arterial layers, including intima, media, or adventitia. And there are two uh, known mechanisms. Uh, the first uh, is an intimal tear that causes an intramural hematoma to develop. And the second, perhaps less well known, is a spontaneous bleeding into the arterial wall, uh, such as from rupture of vasobasorum. Nevertheless, either of these mechanisms can result in intramural hematoma formation and compression of the ar artery lumen, uh, which then compromises the anti-grade blood flow and can cause myocardial ischemia or infarction. So the very first case report of SCAD was actually published in 1931. And this is an interesting story. This is a 42-year-old woman who was uh, um, ingesting a good meal of fish and chips in the neighborhood store, uh, but subsequently had uh, food poisoning. Um, so she had severe retching and vomiting that persisted throughout the evening. And interestingly, at 3 o'clock in the morning, she got up. She was going to vomit, um, and she did that one last time as, and suddenly fell back uh, in her husband's arm, and she died. So the following day, uh, they did an autopsy on her and found that she had a um, marked atheroma in the right coronary artery with dissecting aneurysm, which had evidently ruptured during the last episode of violent uh, retching and vomiting. So this is quite a harrowing story. Um, since the very first case report, there's been less than 1,500 cases that's been reported worldwide. Um, generally, the diagnosis is made by coronary angiogram. Uh, it's seen and reported in approximately 0.2 to 1.1% of coronary angiograms. And it's been reported to be an infrequent cause of acute coronary syndrome, ranging from 0.1 to 4% and also a rare cause of sudden cardiac death, 0.4%. Now, looking at a bit of uh, older data in terms of prevalence of SCAD, it really depends on the population studied. In this series by Benzetto, uh, women were six times more likely than men to have SCAD, especially younger women less than age 50, and particularly uh, young women less than age 50 presenting with acute coronary syndrome, such as ST elevation MI, which accounted for 11%. Now, this is a, a more recent study uh, by Nishiguchi in Japan uh, amongst uh, about 326 patients who had acute coronary syndrome. Uh, they routinely did OCT imaging or optical coherence uh, optometry to, uh, to explore the culprit artery. And what they found was that on OCT, SCAT was observed in 4% uh, of these cases. But just keep in mind that in this uh, series, uh, the majority of patients were men in 77% and there were a, uh, a significant proportion of patients in this study where the scale was actually due to atherosclerosis. When we looked at this in our series of patients, we targeted young women. So when we retrospectively reviewed um, all young women aged 50 and younger who underwent coronary angiogram in our hospital over a two-year period, uh, we segregated uh, the causes um, uh, found um, based upon um, angiographic findings of atherosclerotic coronary disease, non-atherosclerotic disease, or normal disease, and we found coronary dissection to affect 
of these young women. And amongst patients uh, who present with the acute coronary syndrome in this young woman population, SCAD caused 24% of this myocardial infarction. So uh, clearly, um, SCAD is underdiagnosed, and therefore the true prevalence of SCAD uh, is not uh, known. Um, the prevalence as well depends on the population study and the definition used. Um, and the diagnosis of SCAD is unfortunately challenging. It's not as easy as searching for a zebra amongst the horses. So why is SCAD underdiagnosed? Uh, there are multiple reasons for this. Uh, first, um, importantly, uh, there has been low index of clinical suspicion uh, for patients presenting with uh, acute coronary syndrome that this may be caused by SCAD. Um, as well, the gold standard for diagnosing SCAD a coronary angiogram is un un unfortunately an imperfect test, uh, which is a, a two-dimensional luminogram that depicts three-dimensional arteries and it does not image the arterial wall. As well as angiographers, um, we've been relying on the pathognomonic changes on angiogram to diagnose SCAD, and these textbook definitions uh, include finding uh, multiple lumen, extraluminal contrast, spiral dissection, contrast staining, etc. And we're not familiar with the other angiographic variants of SCAD. And um, certainly there has been an underuse of IVIS or OCT as intracoronary imaging to diagnose SCAD. So there are multiple reasons uh, why SCAD can be missed uh, or misdiagnosed as atherosclerosis. So in fact, um, I'll just show you the three cases uh, that got me interested in SCAD. I saw these three cases in a two-week period at Vancouver General Hospital in April 2011. And so you can see on the angiograms here on the left side, long disease in the mid to, to distal right coronary artery, the middle panel, disease in the mid LAD, and then the right panel, disease in the mid LAD as well. Um, and 2011 also coincided with uh, our hospital acquiring the, the uh, OCT machine. And so for these three unusual young women presenting with acute coronary syndrome, we performed OCT, and lo and behold, we found that all three patients had intramural hematoma in the arterial wall that was due to spontaneous coronary dissection. So finding three cases in two weeks certainly um, showed that this condition was not rare. And in fact, when you look at um, the older classification of dissection uh, by NHLBI, this classification was actually meant for um, the classification of dissection after balloon angioplasty, and it does not include dissection where there is no intimal tear. Um, and therefore, we, this, this categorization is actually not a useful clinical tool um, currently. Uh, we came up with a new angiogram classification for spontaneous coronary dissection, and uh, this is uh, simply uh, classified into types 1, 2, uh, and 3. Type 1 uh, is the standard pathognomonic changes seen on coronary angiogram, which includes multiple radiolucent lumen, contrast staining of artery wall, or intraluminal filling defect. You can see on the left screen here a spiral dissection of the mid uh, to apical LED with complete occlusion of the vessel. Um, and uh, on the right hand side, it's a more subtle um, abnormality in the obtuse marginal branch. Uh, in the proximal to mid part of this vessel, and you can see towards the, the mid part of the vessel at uh, the most severe stenosis, uh, there was contrast um, extraluminal staining of the artery wall. So it can be subtle or it can be more obvious, and these are the other examples of type 1 angiographic SCAD. Now, type 2 angiographic SCAD involves diffuse stenosis of various severity, and these are examples here. We have uh, subcategorized it into variant A, where you can have normal segments, proximal and distal to the SCAD segment, as shown here in the ramus intermedius artery. And uh, about a year later, repeat angiogram on this patient showed normalization of the same segment in the ramus intermedius. Variant B um, involves a dissection that extends to the distal tip of the artery. So in this example here, you can see the stenosis coming from the um, mid-segment uh, of the right posterolateral branch that extends to the very tip of the vessel. Now, this uh, variant can be missed um, because of misdiagnosis or calling it uh, normal tapering. And here's uh, the example 
several months later showing spontaneous healing, and you can see the clear difference between the left panel and the right panel. And um, the type 2 um, angiographic scab can also be of varying severity. So minor stenosis here in the circumflex artery, which on OCT uh, represented intramural hematoma, which was only mildly compressive of the lumen. On the right-hand panel is a more severe stenosis in the mid-LAD, uh, and um, which is almost completely occlusive. But several months later, uh, the artery spontaneously healed. Um, as you can see here, uh, the video is running a bit slowly. Um, let me just go to the next slide. There's a bit of a hang-up here, I think. My videos stopped running. Um, nevertheless, that's fine. I'll keep talking. Um, type 3 angiograph angiographic SCAD uh, essentially mimics atherosclerosis. And uh, typically, the appearance is of a tubular uh, stenosis. Um, there it is. It's just uh, lagging in time here on the web. Um, so this example here shows the mid-LED with a stenosis of roughly 70% in the mid-segment. And, um, and on OCT, this clearly showed uh, intramural hematoma with a double lumen, as well there is an intimal tear. And this is a different example of a mid-LED uh, that has the appearance of uh, looking like an atherosclerotic lesion. But on OCT, again, this showed uh, intramural hematoma. And um, this patient was treated conservatively. And several months later, the mid-LED um, on repeat angiogram showed uh, spontaneous healing of the artery. Now, these are other examples of type 3 angiographic appearance of SCAD. Unfortunately, for type 3, because they appear like atherosclerosis, um, further imaging with intracoronary uh, imaging is, is recommended for diagnosis. So in this same paper that we described the classification of angiographic SCAD, we provided an algorithm to help uh, SCAD diagnosis. So in a setting of um, patients where you are very suspicious for coronary dissection as um, manifested by features shown on the table on the right side, uh, these patients should undergo uh, coronary angiography. If they do have type 1 um, changes on the angiogram, then the diagnosis of SCAD is made. Um, if they don't have that, um, we need to look for type 2 changes, which represents diffuse and smooth stenosis. If we see uh, that appearance, we normally give intracoronary nitroglycerin and then consider either doing an OCT or IVIS or repeating angiogram in four to six weeks to look for spontaneous healing. Now, if we don't see this, and instead we see an atherosclerotic potentially mimicking lesion uh, in that uh, setting, then the OCT or IVIS would have to be performed to confirm the diagnosis of SCAD. So when we utilize this classification in our um, series of patients uh, that we published in certain intervention last year, um, now inclusive of 203 dissected arteries, we found that um, uh, the majority of patients in about two-thirds of cases have the type 2 long diffuse type stenosis. Um, only about 29% had a type 1 pathognomonic uh, angiographic uh, multiple radiolucent lumen, and less than 5% had a type 3 uh, changes of uh, mimicking atherosclerosis. So if, and essentially, if you are uh, utilizing um, the old school pathognomonic changes of uh, multiple lumen and wall stain with contrast, then you could be missing uh, over two-thirds of coronary dissection on angiogram. Now, intracoronary imaging has uh, really played a major role to help us understand what the angiograms of SCAD will look like. Um, and I've shown in this slide um, the characteristics of OCT and IVIS on different panels, and these are both examples of coronary dissection shown on both these imaging modalities. You can see that OCT is uh, clearly better in resolution, uh, down to 10 to 20 microns, whereas IVIS has a lower resolution of 150 to 200 microns. Uh, but it does have better penetration, so IVIS can visualize the full extent of the hematoma, whereas OCT, uh, there is poorer penetration, so you may not necessarily see the full extent of the hematoma in some cases. Um, but because of the superior resolution, OCT can clearly 
uh, delineate the true and false lumen, uh, visualize the intramural hematoma, visualize intimal tear, and even interluminal thrombi uh, superior to IBIS. So uh, in a setting of uh, intracoronary imaging to diagnose SCAD, uh, we typically need either intramural hematoma or the presence of the double lumen. And in some cases, you may observe an intimal rupture, and you may also observe luminal thrombi, as shown in the, um, these examples here. Now, Dr. Alfonso's um, laboratories, are pub they have pub published a few publications on um, intracoronary imaging uh, on OCT as well as IVIS. In this series of 11 patients, um, uh, OCT confirmed the presence of SCAD. In these 11 cases, all of them had double lumen or intramural hematoma. Uh, nine had intramural hematoma. Seven had intimal tear. Therefore, not all patients would have uh, intimal, intimal um, rupture uh, as, as the cause. And um, it's important to note that uh, these features don't really change the outcome. Um, nevertheless, there are some pros and cons of uh, intracoronary imaging um, for SCAD diagnosis, uh, even though that they are clearly uh, advantageous in the sense that it, they provide definitive diagnosis of SCAD, um, and also they can be helpful in a setting of PCI uh, where uh, we can observe the true lumen entry by the wires, and we can also facilitate stent sizing and stent apposition. Um, there are some disadvantages, including being invasive is not available uh, necessarily in all labs, and it's certainly uh, some costs associated with these procedures. And there's also a risk of extending the, dis di the dissection by the guide catheters, coronary wires, the imaging catheters, and potentially by hydraulic extension, and also potentially vessel occlusion uh, causing ischemia by the catheter and embolization. Therefore, if uh, you can minimize uh, intracoronary imaging, um, uh, uh, if you have a better, um, if you're able to diagnose on coronary angiogram alone, that will be um, preferred. Uh, what we tried to do was uh, go back the other way uh, from what we learned from OCT and IVIS to see what the coronary angiogram's appearance would be uh, for patients with SCAD. So uh, we've recently had this publication in, CA in CCI um, where we looked at uh, 25 SCAD arteries uh, which have been proven to have intramural hematoma on intracoronary imaging. And we went back and uh, looked at the angiographic appearance. And indeed, the, uh, these lesions are uh, fairly long, especially the type 2 angiographic forms of SCAD where the mean QCA length was 61 millimeters. Uh, the type 3 lengths that mimic atherosclerosis are a bit shorter at 22. And uh, this uh, slide here just shows the various examples of type 2 and type 3 angiographic SCAD and the corresponding uh, intracoronary imaging that proves intramural hematoma. So after um, seeing several of these cases, we're pretty comfortable in making the diagnosis of type 2 SCAD on angiogram alone. Um, and uh, we, we limit our utilization of OCT IVIS to patients with type 3 uh, appearing lesions. So cardiologists need to be familiar with angiographic variants of SCAD to improve the diagnosis of SCAD. And we have uploaded several of these angiographic examples in our website at uh, scad.ubc.ca. So let's move on to predisposing causes and precipitating stressors. Um, in the older literature, uh, you may have uh, read that uh, postpartum or peripartum cases accounted for over a third of cases and that the remainder of SCAD cases are considered idiopathic. Um, however, recent um, registries uh, uh, refute uh, these uh, claims. In fact, typically, um, patients with SCAD have underlying predisposing arteriopathy and uh, they may have precipitating stress events. Uh, these predisposing arteriopathies can be broadly divided into atherosclerotic forms of SCAD or non-atherosclerotic forms of SCAD. In fact, atherosclerotic SCAD is essentially coronary artery disease um, and it predominantly affects um, male um, and it's uh, really not what we're talking about when we talk about non-atherosclerotic SCAD. Uh, in essence, when we usually say SCAD, we imply um, non-atherosclerotic forms of SCAD. Uh, 
And for the remainder of the talk, I'll be focusing uh, on the non-atherosclerotic SCAD. So non-atherosclerotic causes include fibromuscular dysplasia, pregnancy, uh, and uh, connected tissue disorders such as cystic meal necrosis, Marfan's, allostanos, systemic inflammation like lupus, Crohn's, coronary artery spasm, hormonal therapy, and precipitating stress events increases the cardiocirculatory circul stress and can include intense exercises, emotional stress, um, uh, going through uh, pregnancy labor, use of uh, illicit drugs like cocaine, retching and vomiting like the index case, uh, even straining, intense straining of bowel movements or coughing uh, can precipitate patients with pre-underlying um, abnormal artery wall. Now, this is just a tabular form uh, showing these predisposing arteriopathies and pre precipitating stress events. I'd just like to focus on fibromuscular dysplasia, which is one of the most dominant associated uh, cause for coronary dissection. Now, we first uh, uh, published about this um, about three years ago now. We uh, published the first case series that described um, the association of spontaneous coronary dissection in patients with FMD. In fact, the first three cases that I showed earlier all had fibromuscular dysplasia. And when we're submitting to CERC intervention uh, and undergoing revisions, we actually accumulated another four cases. Uh, so we bundled these uh, case series of six cases together in this first publication. And you might, you, might remem you might remember one of the earlier publications by one of the members of our group, Dr. Buller, uh, back a few years ago in 2005 when they reported a few cases of patients with fibromuscular dysplasia in the renal arteries with appearance on coronary arteries of distal tapering. At that time, they thought uh, these angiographic changes represented coronary FMD, uh, but uh, because they did not have those imaging modality to actually show that uh, those were, in fact, coronary dissection, uh, not necessarily coronary FMD. In our first uh, uh, publication of 50 patient series, uh, with non-atherosclerotic SCAD, uh, we uh, routinely screen these patients uh, for presence of FMD in multiple different territories, in the cerebrovasculature, in the abdomen, and the, re the renals and iliacs. And we found that 86% uh, of patients have FMD in at least one non-coronary territory. And interestingly, 16% of patients have cerebral aneurysm. And these are not pseudoaneurysm, these are purely intracranial uh, aneurysms, 16%. In our subsequent uh, publication, which included 168 patient cohort that are prospectively followed in our SCAD clinic at Vancouver General Hospital, um, likewise, uh, we uh, showed that uh, a high proportion of patients, 72% of patients, have underlying fibromuscular dysplasia. The other causes of SCAD are a lot less frequent, uh, postpartum, less than 5%, systemic inflammatory condition, 9%, connective tissue disorder, 1%. Multiparity, we define as four or greater bursts in about 9%. Uh, grand multiparity, less than 1%. Grand multigravida, meaning, meaning five or greater number of pregnancies, in 8%. On hormonal therapy, 11%. Only about 21% were found to be idiopathic, and of these ones, uh, over half have not been completely screened yet for FMD. Now, in a recent publication uh, from the Mayo Clinic group, uh, in their 115 patients who, are, who were seen at the Mayo Clinic uh, in the past four years, uh, when they screen uh, with uh, CT angiogram with a total body scan of the neck, chest, abdomen, and pelvis, they found um, extra coronary vascular abnormalities in 72% of cases in patients who had these full body screen, and 52% overall had fibromuscular dysplasia. And um, interestingly, they found 25% of patients with intracranial aneurysm, but it's not clear if they included pseudoaneurysm as well. But nevertheless, um, uh, they also found a significant proportion of patients with fibromuscular dysplasia. FMD, uh, just briefly, is an idiopathic segmental, non-atherosclerotic, non-inflammatory disease of artery walls that predominantly affect small to medium-sized arteries. 
And the conventional classification was based upon histology, but more recently, in the AHA consensus document, the recommendation is to utilize a more simple um, criteria of multifocal or focal. Now, FMD results in proliferation of smooth muscle cells and fibrous tissues in the artery walls and can result in stenosis and also weaken arterial wall, causing dissection. Very briefly, FMD angiographic appearance uh, can uh, appear as multifocal string of beats appearance, but also can present as focal stenosis, tubular stenosis, tortuosity of vessels, aneurysms, dissections, uh, dilatations, etc. As well, there are different gradations of severity of uh, angiographic findings, although this classification is really not well used. I show it here simply to show you that um, uh, the multifocal beating pattern can really range from mild to severe, which includes complete occlusion. And in many cases, CT angiogram or MR angiogram uh, are not adequate to diagnose uh, these mild forms of FMD. So in cases where you're just using CTA or MRA to screen, you might miss some of these cases. So what we routinely do or, and recommend uh, for patients presenting with SCAD is that during their index coronary angiogram, uh, to image the renal and iliac at the same time uh, under digital subjection uh, angiography, or DSA, which would provide us with the highest yield. Uh, if this is not done, then we would uh, perform a CTA instead. In terms of the head and neck vasculature, uh, we typically would do a CTA, and as we've shown, roughly about 15% of patients would have intracranial aneurysm and would require appropriate referrals to specialists as required. We would also screen for other predisposing arteriopathies, typically through um, his patient history and questionnaires. Uh, and in very infrequent cases, we would refer to our genetic clinic. Uh, and you might be aware of a recent uh, publication from the Mayo Clinic group where uh, there were five familial cases um, uh, that were uh, seen out of 412 uh, patients with SCAT in the virtual Mayo Clinic SCAT registry. Therefore, overall, only approximately 1% of patients have familial forms of SCAD, which represents a very small proportion of SCAD patients. Uh, but more importantly uh, is the presence of precipitating stressors in patients presenting with SCAD. Um, when we routinely um, uh, ask our patients uh, about their precipitating stressors, including emotional and physical activity stressors, we, saw, we found that 41% of patients reported emotional stress. And uh, of these, um, approximately half were within the week, and over three, about over three quarters uh, were high or severe level of stress, and that includes job-related stress, and death in the family, arguments, relationship breakdown, or moving in the, de in the descending order. Um, in terms of patients reporting exercise um, uh, uh, association, in about a quarter of cases, half of these were heavy isometrics lifting over 50 pounds, and these were reported by half of them within a day of SCAD and 80% within a week of SCAD. And therefore, precipitating stressors and predisposing arteriopathies are quite common and we routinely uh, screen and ask regarding uh, the precipita their precipitants. Now, moving on to uh, SCAD presentation, uh, who uh, gets SCAD, who presents with SCAD. In our series of 168 patients, uh, we found a mean age of 52. So SCAD does not necessarily only involve younger women. Even though 95% of patients with SCAD are less than age 65, 60% um, are older than age 50. In fact, uh, roughly 60% of patients are postmenopausal uh, when they present with SCAD. So it's, just not, it's not limited to young women. 92% um, of our population uh, were women overall, um, and SCAD, uh, SCAD patients tend to be relatively healthy. Otherwise, they have a low BMI, normal at 25. It can affect any um, race. In our population, 81% were Caucasian. That represents our population here in, in Vancouver. Other cardiovascular risk factors like diabetes is only quite low at 5%. So how do patients present with SCAD in all series? Uh, all patients presented with acute coronary syndrome and all had elevation 
of troponin, including high sensitivity troponin. Um, about a quarter of patients presented with ST elevation forms of myocardial infarction, and the remainder with non-ST elevation MI, and about 4% presented with ventricular tachycardia or fibrillation. In terms of what symptoms they present with, the vast majority of patients have chest pain in over 90% of cases, and many others describe radiation to arms or necks, uh, symptoms of nausea, vomiting, diaphoresis, uh, et cetera. In terms of angiographic presentation, what arteries are involved, um, LED is the most commonly involved, although any arteries can be involved, and about 10% involve the proximal artery, uh, and about 20% have involvement in more than one coronary artery. And there's a wide spectrum of presentation with SCAD. Uh, fortunately, majority of patients have small myocardial infarction with no further chest pain when they present in the cath lab, and this can affect the management of these patients. Um, and typically, uh, the recommendation uh, nowadays are to adhere to a conservative therapy unless patients have high-risk features, such as ongoing chest pain or ischemia, recurrent pain, cardiogenic shock, VTVF, or left main dissection. And the reason that we advocate being conservative uh, is because uh, PCI with SCAD are notorious, uh, notoriously challenging. Uh, and these are the reasons uh, we may have difficulty advancing the coronary wire into the true lumen. We may propagate the intramural hematoma both proximally and distally with balloon angioplasty and stenting, and therefore further extending the dissection and compromising flow. And the dissection tends to extend into distal arteries, which are too small to stent. And this is just a brief example here. You see a long dissection in the mid to distal LED, and so this operator place a stent in the mid-segment of the uh, LED, but there was residual tear beyond the stented segment, and they did not feel that they can stent further. And what happened was the following day, the patient presented with acute chest pain and acute stent thrombosis, and uh, following further attempts of uh, stenting further down, they can't go distally to the apical segment of the LED. Uh, they left it as that, and a year later, the stent was occluded anyways. So this is just one example of challenges uh, with uh, dissection. There's also, uh, because of the need of long stents, a high risk of stent restenosis. And there's also a new uh, a phenomenon of stent malaposition after resorption of intramural hematoma, uh, which might lead to late stent thrombosis. And we described this in a recent uh, case series of three cases um, uh, that we published at the cardiovascular diagnostic therapy. And you can see on the left-hand panel, a patient where it was implanted with cipher stents, and following that, it was marked a late malaposition and stent uh, thrombosis um, following a cessation of endoendipoidal therapy. On the right-hand panel are two other patients where with early reabsorption of intramural hematoma, we start seeing uh, malaposition of the stent struts. This was three days after, and this was about two weeks after. Um, these initiating SCAD events. There's also potential risk of guide-induced coronary dissection, especially when doing PCI. And in this example here, this patient has an apical LED dissection, uh, but the guide catheter was relatively deep, and during diagnostic angiography, this guide catheter, there was a guide-induced dissection. And unfortunately, this patient tore the left main uh, because of the guide, and they could not salvage it by uh, PCI and the patient needed emergency bypass surgery. Um, therefore, PCI with for SCAD is not without risk. And also, very importantly, most affected arteries tend to heal spontaneously without revascularization, and therefore we need to avoid the ocular stenotic reflex. Now, when we look at our series of patients with SCAD, 80% uh, were treated conservatively, um, and 17% underwent PCI overall. In these population, uh, only a third Sorry, a third were unsuccessful. Of the remainder that were successful, partially successful, um, uh, a lot of them required re-intervention. Uh, overall durable success was only 30%. On the other hand, patients treated conservatively, 4.5% um, of recurrent MI in the hospital, um, and uh, half of these were treated uh, conservatively without issues. Uh, two required PCI, which failed, and one required cabbage. Um, but the majority of patients did well, 
In fact, when we repeated coronary angiogram in almost 80 of these patients, all showed healing of these arteries by four weeks. And just showing very briefly here, the RPDA is dissected in one of these patients seven months later. The artery has nicely healed spontaneously. And this is another example showing the dissected LED I showed earlier in spontaneous healing uh, a couple of months later. And here's another example here, uh, RPDA type 1 angiographic dissection, and six weeks later, angiographic healing. Um, as well, other groups, such as the Mayo Clinic, also showed that the PCI uh, failure uh, was 30%, re recurrent SCAT 15%. In a more recent uh, registry publication from Italy of 134 patients, the PCI success was also only 70%. So we all appear to have similar outcomes where PCI uh, outcome success rate is relatively low, somewhere in the range of 60 to 70 percent. In terms of cabbage, um, as well in the uh, retrospective Mayo Clinic series, of the 12 patients who had cabbage, eight underwent repeat angiogram, uh, 11 of these 15 grafts were occluded. Um, and th th this series, a couple cases, case series here shows that even with left main dissection for patients who underwent bypass surgery, these patients actually subsequently had healing of the coronary coronary arteries themselves, and therefore the bypass grafts are no longer necessary, and that's probably a reason why these grafts um, uh, become atretic uh, compared to other population of patients. Um, nevertheless, if you were to pursue PCI, there are some recommendations such as putting long stents and using potentially bioabsorbable stents and to use OCT uh, to optimize results. So just going through very quickly, and we're, we're running out of time soon, um, for patients with these high-risk features, those are the patients we would consider whether PCI is feasible from an anatomic perspective. If it's not feasible in a patient of ongoing ischemia, then they should be considered for cabbage, particularly if they have left main involvement. In patients who are unstable, we need to consider uh, LVAD or ECMO therapy for support. Medical therapy, unfortunately, there's not a lot of data in essence of, of all these medications. Uh, typically, in hospital patients are on aspirin uh, as well as beta blocker. Uh, we stop the heparin uh, once we uh, know, well, once we diagnose SCAD. Uh, we uh, do not recommend thrombolytic, which can worsen uh, the outcome. Uh, patients are started on beta blockers routinely. They may uh, be started on ACE inhibitor if there's left ventricular dysfunction. We typically do not continue patients on stents unless uh, they have underlying dyslipidemia to begin with, uh, and nitrate is not uh, commonly used. So typically long-term will be aspirin and beta blocker. In other ways of uh, managing patients post, um, SCAD includes um, uh, cardiac rehabilitation. I think very importantly, uh, we started a SCAD-specific cardiac rehab program uh, in November 2011, and since then have been enrolled over 70 patients, and we try to be broad, um, uh, approaching um, education not only for exercise and exercise monitoring, but also providing psychosocial support, peer group support from other patients with SCAD, uh, regular follow-up by cardiovascular specialists, and providing education uh, from dietary and, and regarding cerebrovascular uh, cardiovascular disease. And as well, we have a patient page, a cardiology patient page, uh, to put in layman's term what this condition is. We provide these uh, documentation to patients when they present with SCAD. And finally, uh, what are the long-term outcomes or in-hospital outcomes of these patients? Uh, newer data now shows in-hospital uh, complications to be relatively low overall with recurrent MI in hospital, about 5%, mortality close to 0% in hospital. In terms of long-term follow-up, the two-year MACE uh, is somewhere between 10 to 20% 20, 20 in our population. Recurrent SCAD does occur in about 13 to 15% of cases, recurrent MI around the same incidence, and other series reported similar, recurrent dissection in the Mayo Clinic cohort about 17%, and um, uh, likewise, um, other series show similar recurrent SCAD and recurrent MI rates. So in summary, what have we learned so far? SCAD is clearly underdiagnosed, is a lot more frequent than previously reported, uh, the majority of patients have underlying FMV and requires routine screening. Uh, precipitating emotional or physical stressors are common. The most common angiographic appearance is a long diffuse narrowing, uh, with, which is uh, classified as type 2, 
less than a third had these pathognomonic contrast wall stains. Uh, PCI, unfortunately, is associated with poor long-term outcome, um, and uh, naturally, conservative therapy is recommended as the first-line therapy at this point unless patients have ongoing ischemia, uh, and typically, a conservative therapy is associated with angiographic healing in a majority of patients uh, at follow-up after four weeks. Um, because recurrent SCAD and MI are, re are frequent, a regular long-term cardiovascular follow-up is recommended. Now, there are uh, several registries that are ongoing, uh, including ours, uh, the Canadian SCAD study, which is funded by the Canadian Institutes of Health Research, uh, and we're enrolling patients prospectively with SCAD in more than 20 centers throughout Canada, as well as a single center in the United States at the Cleveland Clinic, and with the intention that we'll enroll over 750 uh, to 1,000 patients um, and, and look into the natural history of this condition in more detail. Thank you for your attention. Happy That's fantastic. Questions. Thanks so much, Dr. Saw, for this um, fascinating update and scan. Um, we actually have a few questions from our audience, so I'll, I'll launch into the first one. Mm -hmm. um, why are proportionally more women suffering from SCAD than men? Right, that's a very good question. Um, in a setting of non-atherosclerotic SCAD, um, as, as I said earlier, the predominantly we found a very strong association in the, between 70 to 80 percent of patients with SCAD have FMD, and FMD is a condition that also predominantly affects women in over 90% of cases. So I think there is that common link there uh, for predisposition to women. There are also other uh, predisposing arteriopathies that predominantly affect women, so being peripartum, uh, being on hormonal therapy, uh, multiple pregnancies in the past with the recurrent exposure to estrogen and progesterone that can weaken the arterial wall can all increase the subsequent risk of SCAD in women. Uh, men with SCAD is a, a different uh, population, um, and you know they they do have coronary FMD uh, possibly, and they also have um, uh, aggressive, intense uh, physical activities as precipitants as well. So, you know the underlying characteristic is slightly different. Um, so, in in the majority of cases for non athletic SCAD, we find that roughly a 90% prepon preponderance affecting women. Okay, that's, that's a great answer. And also talking about women, what about pregnancy? Can they be pregnant again after they have SCAD? That's a very good question. In general, uh, we would uh, recommend uh, that our SCAD patients, our SCAD women, uh, not become pregnant again. And that's important because a lot of them actually are young women uh, who are still um, able to conceive. Uh, and um, uh, it's, uh, it's really not a good idea, although we don't have a lot of data about this. There is a small series of... Uh, uh, eight patient case reports uh, from the Mayo Clinic group uh, of patients with previous SCAD diagnosis who then subsequently became pregnant. And of these eight patients, one ended up uh, suffering postpartum SCAD and uh, required uh, bypass surgery. Um, so even though this is just a small series, uh, nevertheless, because of the potential risk of peripartum SCAD, uh, we do not recommend that uh, uh, patients be pregnant again. Um, and the concern, too, is with peripartum SCAD uh, that their presentations can be a lot more sinister than the average forms of SCAD. Uh, in my spectrum of presentations, I showed the majority of patients actually present with small degree of myocardial infarction, uh, whereas what we've seen um, and seen reported in the literature is that patients with peripartum forms of SCAD tend to be the more severe forms with larger um, uh, wall motion abnormalities a larger enzyme elevation, and the more involved in the proximal vessels as opposed to other forms of SCAD. So peripartum SCAD um, uh, can be more sinister, but we need larger studies uh, like the prospective studies that we're doing to further evaluate this. Okay. So, um, one final question that's come in also is what medications are typically administered for these patients? Right. Um, so in the hospital, we typically... Uh, initiate patients with aspirin therapy, and before, angi before angiography, patients typically would have been given uh, unfortunate heparin or other anticoagulation. But once diagnosis of SCAD is made, uh, we stop uh, the heparin therapy. Um, a lot of times, patients are, have also been administered uh, uh, thionopyridine, such as Plavix. And we tend to continue Plavix for somewhere between 1 to 12 months, according to the, the CURE study. 
Um, patients uh, typically remain on aspirin long term. Uh, we normally do start up on beta blockers in hospital uh, because beta blockers reduce the DPDT, thus reducing the arterial shore stress, and uh, hopefully would reduce uh, recurrence of uh, coronary dissections. Uh, it's routinely used for patients with aortic dissection, so we extrapolate the data here. So all patients continue on beta blockers long term. And um, beyond that, uh, ACE inhibitor not routinely used unless there is wall motion abnormality. Statin is not routinely used unless they have pre-existing uh, dyslipidemia. And nitrate uh, typically not used unless they have uh, re uh, ongoing recurrent pain and overlying uh, coronary spasm. So typically it's aspirin and beta blocker long term. Okay, that's great. Well, thank you very much for the comprehensive answer there. Um, well, that brings us to a close. Um, it just remains to say thank you so much, Dr. Saul, for, for joining us again and answering these questions. It's been a pleasure having with you with us today again, and um, thank you also to our viewers for watching today. Um, and one final note would be great for if anyone tuning in today could rate the webinar using the star rating system on your screens. So thank you for that, and, and goodbye, and thank you, Dr. Saul. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.